<laughs> All right. Um, I think I started last time, didn't I? Well, you did the first book, so probably. Must have. Must have. You'd think that we would write it down. You know what? On my notes, I'm writing down. Megan started. Okay. So next week, we'll know. I'd write it on mine, but I just throw these away. As you can tell, this is... (laughs) We are just starting this podcast. Hello. (laughs) And my notes have one, two, three, four crease lines in them. And a coffee stain. Mm-hmm. And I have not used them until this very moment. Yeah. <laughs> That's the state they begin. And I have a lovely notebook. Yeah. With tabs. It looks nice. Yeah. Don't Hand- look. Your handwriting a, looks nice. There's a joke. Oh, okay. Don't read it. Sorry, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Well, welcome to Why Did You Read That? We're here. Uh, starring Megan. Yes, hello. And Peter. Hi. <laughs> I don't know why we did it that way. I don't know either. <laughs> I just I just went for it. This is a mm-hmm. podcast in which we each bring four books, mm-hmm. talk about two apiece in depth and yep. two apiece in shallow. Nice. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> everyone, you're going to have to excuse me, and Megan, you're going to have to excuse me. I'm a little punchy. Yeah, well, um, I mean, you have coffee, which is unusual for you, so I'm is. not surprised. Uh, I'm very sleepy. I did an at-home sleep study last night. Oh. Um, so you have to, okay, so you have to put this gizmo, you have to put these tubes in your nose is and, like, like tape stuff to your thing? face. and No, it's way worse. Okay. There's like, And there's a thing that goes around your chest. It's like if you had a, an elastic band and then you put, like, a Nintendo controller on your chest. Uh-huh. Um, it's, and then a thing goes on your finger, you know, all this stuff. How are they expecting to get like legitimate information about how you sleep when they're like basically binding you up in a torture device? I don't know. I don't know how any of these come back and they're like, you slept great. (laughs) Cause I'm like, (laughs) I nearly died and, you know, being entangled in cords and like (laughs) having dreams of being, you know, bound by rope all night. But the worst part was, so I'm I'm taking this all out of the the box. It comes in this little case that looks like something an assassin puts their gun in, oh. but like shrunk way down. <laughs> so I guess a, a mini very assassin. yeah, a very tiny assassin, <laughs> Doll Man, probably from okay. the movie Doll Man. I don't know what that is. But sure, that's a movie about an alien uh, cop who comes from another world, and he's about the size of a Ken doll. So he's called Doll Man, but he's not actually tiny. On his world, he's normal sized. Right. But then on in our world, he's tiny. Um, anyway, he <laughs> once fought the demonic toys from the titular demonic toys. Uh, anyway, so I'm strapping this thing on and you put it on with this elastic band and it's supposed to go on your upper chest, kind of under your arms. Mm-hmm. And I was putting it on and I was like, this smells really weird. And then I took a big sniff of it and I was like, oh my God, whoever wore this last had some like body odor oh. going. And then I was like, this is lovely. Like, I'm going to wear this thing and just have this. It's not the absolute worst place to wear something that's soaked in someone's body odor would be, like, on your face. Mm-hmm. I think second worst, though, is your upper chest, probably. Where it can nicely waft right at your yeah, face. All night. Yeah. <laughs> the entire night. So between the tubes in my nose... The uh, scent of a stranger's body odor, who I kept, you know, I kept picturing what they looked like through the night, and it got worse and worse <laughs> as the night went on. Yeah. Um, and then also, uh, you know, if you move around too much or something, I don't know exactly how it works, but there are lights on it that will light up and be like, quit doing whatever you're doing. And so those would periodically flash in my eyes. <laughs> so, like, suffice to say, I didn't sleep great. Yeah. So I guess we'll see what the results of this test are. I would guess that you didn't sleep great. That would be my guess as well. Yeah. It will be kind of interesting, too, if they're like, well, the test shows you didn't sleep great. And I'd be like, oh, no kidding. Amazing. Good thing you came up with this sophisticated instrument to tell me that information. Yeah. I could have told you that. I mean, I could just wrap you in bungee cords and then you wouldn't sleep well. And I'd be like, ta-da. Yeah. The fact that I woke up for, you know, the 15th time at... 5.50 a.m. and was like, good enough. And then <laughs> took it all off and brought it in. The fact that I had it in your office like before 7 a.m. probably yeah. tells you what you need to know yeah. about my level of sleep. Anyway, 
So you're punchy. I'm a little punchy. That's all right. It's we're a very, ready. But I have an, a good excuse. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Back on track. All right. So we usually kick off with a joke. We do. And I have one for you. Are you ready? I am ready. Maybe you can recreate last month's victory <sighs> and get it actually recorded this time. For those who didn't listen last month, uh, I messed up the recording by bringing a very cheap micro SD card (laughs) that ruined the first 10 minutes or so. And I correctly guessed the punchline to the joke. And so now I'm destined to never get another one. Well, we'll see. All right. Um, I've got my fingers crossed for you. (sighs) Here we go. What is Forrest Gump's email password? Um, Okay. What is that? Um, eight six seven five three zero nine, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I like it, but no. <laughs> it's actually one forest one. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Would be a good uh, Forrest Gump password, though. Yeah, yeah. It's got digits in it. He could do a capital. Exactly. Exclamation point at the end. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, all right. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna give myself four out of ten. Okay. For my answer. I mean, the Jenny was a nice tie-in. Yeah. Thank you. I'd, I'd even go up to five. Thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate it. All right. So I brought four books. Are you ready to hear about them? I'm ready. Okay. I did a thing like I was a magician. Getting my sleeves ready. Good, about to do some close-up magic. <laughs> yeah. Even though I'm wearing a sweater with, you know, look elastic. No sleeves. coins in the sleeve. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, my first book is called Greta and Valden by Rebecca K. Riley. And this is an unusual pick for me because it's kind of literary fiction. It's about um, this family that left Russia as refugees and now lives in New Zealand. And they're like a Russian Maori Spanish family living now in New Zealand. And they're kind of academics. They're all a little neurotic. It's this kind of wacky family with lots of problems. And um, I thought it was such a nice book, actually. Okay. By the end, I so loved it. Is this in, like, modern times? Yes. Okay. Um, then I have a graphic novel called See You in My 19th Life, and I read <laughs> volume one. Uh, it's by Lee Hai. I'm probably mispronouncing that because I imagine the author is Korean, and there's probably a different way to say that, but I don't know what it is. Um, and it's been adapted into a Netflix series, so it's on mm. Netflix right now. Uh, And it is about a character who has lived 18 lives and is on their 19th life and remembers all of their their past lives. And so in the 18th life, which um, she died very young, she had started to fall in love with, um, with this little boy that she knew. And so in her 19th life, she is living with the purpose of finding him and reuniting Mm. with him and trying to recreate that situation hmm. only to find that he is still kind of hung up on her 18th. So. Oh no. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. That's yeah. a great setup. Okay. Yeah, I thought so. Uh, then I've got Bride by Allie Hazelwood, um, who is like a big name in romance right now. This is her latest. And it's uh, about a vampire named Misery Lark. So it's like a, a <laughs> modern regular world. But um, in it, so that you've got humans who are normal, you've got vampires who don't actually drink human blood. Um, they, I think they have to, or no, they do drink human blood, but they don't drink from humans. They like have blood ah, and stuff. Okay. Um, and then you've got like wares, like shape changers. And so Misery Lark is a vampire and she's the daughter of a powerful councilman. And then you've got the alpha of the wares in the city who's named Low Moreland. And the the three, like, factions are always on the verge of, like, violence. And so to try and make stability, they have, like, an arranged marriage between Misery and Low to kind of create <laughs> this. Um, I just, those two names marrying know, together so is good. very funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is my husband, Misery. This is Low. And this is our son, uh, Gunner. Sadness. Yeah. <laughs> Absolute <laughs> abysmal depression. Yeah. Um, so th- that's, you know, 
And it, it ends up being a lot about, like, political machinations. Like, she agrees to this arranged marriage because she has a best friend who has disappeared and was a reporter, and she suspects she was looking into something and mm. is hoping that, like, getting access to the werewolves will get, like, let her get information. When she's so, on the inside. Yeah. Mm. Um, great book. I like that. I like that extra added, like, incentive. Yeah. 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 That's good. Uh, and then I have another graphic novel, again, Korean. Whoa. Um, Why Ray Liana Ended Up at the Duke's Mansion, Volume 1. Um, and it's, <laughs> the artist's name is Whale, and the author's name is, I think, Milcha, something like that. Okay. And it is about this girl, a um, modern Korean girl named Yoonha Park. And at the very beginning, she's, like, standing on, like, a balcony or a rooftop or something and turns around and sees someone and then gets pushed off. And so she dies and wakes up in the world of one of her favorite books. But she is a minor side character who she knows is doomed to be murdered. <laughs> so she's like, forget that. Like, I already got pushed off a balcony. So she decides she's going to take matters into her own hands. She's really familiar with this series. So she approaches the hero of the book who's supposed to marry somebody else and says, like, I have all this information about stuff that you're looking into, and I propose that we pretend to be engaged so that I can get away from my fiancé who's going to kill me, which, you know, and then you can get this information. And so it kind of changes the whole plot of the book, and she's, like, in the course of trying to navigate having changed this book and, okay, like, living in a novel. Okay. I like that. Yeah. Is this, like, okay, I have a couple questions. Okay. Because I've never read a Korean graphic mm -hmm. novel. Is it uh, left to right, right to left? It is uh, right to left. Okay. Does it kind of look like a Japanese manga, or is it more like an American style, or does it just depend? Um, I mean, it looks like it's got that that Asian manga style. Mm -hmm. Like, um, it's less like spiky hair, like mm -hmm. you would you would see in like um, the actiony ones. Yes, yeah. and it's less more Dragon like, Ball. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's more like curly flowing hair, but like the very pointed chin and big, big okay. eyes and like all of that stuff is there. I think we call these like shonen and seinen or something like that. There's a bunch of different sure. sort of genres within. I am not well versed, so okay. I, I don't have a whole lot of I'm answers not for you. I do think that at least in, so here's a thing that I learned because mm. um, I have, you know, a relatively new job where now I buy graphic novels for the library district. So I've been doing research and in Korea, um, graphic novels are now largely consumed on phones. Oh. And so like all of these webtoons mm -hmm. that you've probably heard of, mm -hmm. um, that is a, a style that started in Korea so instead oh. of going like left to right or right to left, you go top to bottom and you kind of scroll on your phone and read panel by panel that way. That's fascinating. Uh, yeah, I thought so too. And so these are kind of in that style. They okay. were originally published digitally and now they're being released in print for uh, an American audience. But, gotcha. Yeah. I always felt like that was the leap for comics is eventually they would be created intended to be viewed on a phone yeah. and that would be like the next big thing well it's happening and it's happening in korea well, korea beat me to it yeah probably by 20 <laughs> years <laughs> okay um i oof. i know I, I brought some good ones this week you did i think you're gonna have a hard time picking between mine but for a very different reason <laughs> <laughs> by the way i did have an alona andrews oh but okay. I it was the next one in that edge series but i decided to give her a break I tell you what, if you if you don't want to talk about it next time, we'll we'll make a little extra time at the end. Well, I'm, alone, I'm Andrews, currently but. reading book three in that series, so maybe I'll have a new one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I want to hear about see you in my nineteenth life. Okay. First, because that I like the setup. Yeah. I'm, I'm like, all right, I'm in. Well, and I've only read volume one, so keep in mind that I'm right at the beginning of this story. Um, so you've got this character, Jiyun Ban. And she is, um, I would guess, probably around 10 or 12. Um, it's hard to tell with these like real stylistic kind of, you mm -hmm. know, art. Mm -hmm. But she's young anyway. 
And um, she's right at the age where she's remembered her past lives. So when she's super, super young, she doesn't remember her past lives. And then she hits something like, I don't know, right around that age and remembers that she has lived all these other lives. And um, so now that she remembers kind of her other lives, she's like, I have been there. I have done that. This is boring. Like <laughs> she's kind of over everything. And so she's like a child, but she's mm-hmm. bored with. She's like Every, an old everyone's soul. Everyone's like, oh, exactly. Like she's such an old soul. Oh, <laughs> she's so lucky to have this child. She's so well behaved and so polite. And she's they, like me going around the house complaining about the where the neighbors park their trucks. And stuff. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> Real tuned into what's happening in the neighborhood. <laughs> And in this life, she was kind of born into a rich family, and she's determined to make the most of it. She's like, it's not always this good, so I'm going to live live it up while I have the opportunity. That's an optimistic viewpoint. Yeah. So um, her her mother has a friend um, who has a son who is, I don't know, a few years younger than she is, um, than the main character is. And his mom is sick. And she is part of, like, this family that has a bunch of business concerns. And she's been overseeing this hotel, but now she's ill. And so she's mostly at home. And um, since their mothers are friends, like, they get together a lot. She try, her, you know, tries to help her friend out while she's ill and all of this. And um, tries to convince ji to, like, hang out with him and, like, be his friend. And at first she's like, this kid is a whiner and like, I don't want to be around him. But eventually, like, she starts to see something in him that like breaks the boredom. And she's like, Mm. this feels like I haven't like felt feelings for another person, you know, in a few lives now. Like this is and she starts to like kind of have romantic feelings towards him. And. At first, she tries to avoid him because she's like, don't need this complication. (laughs) But then eventually gives in because his mom dies and he's very lonely and she just can't handle watching him be that sad. So he made a promise to his mom that they they would go to the amusement park for his birthday. But she dies before they can go. Mm. So the main character is like, I will go with you and you bring a picture of your mom and you'll be keeping your promise. And as they're driving to the amusement park, horrible car crash, and she dies. Okay. So then you cut to her in her 19th life, and she, you know, reached the age where she remembered, and she's like, you know, I was young, so I won't be super much younger than he is, so I'm going to find him. So she's like, she's born, this time she's born into poverty, Mm -hmm. Um, but she's like, she, you know, she's done school 19 times, so she's like, she like excels at everything Pretty everyone's easy, like she's yeah. like a savant she's like a genius mind she's like i gotta like get a safety deposit box and lock up all my school papers <laughs> so i can just turn in the same essay again <laughs> like I have to do this all over so she sets herself up basically to be like the most desirable worker in the world and mm. gets a job for this um this guy's company and she, so she, like, knows who he is? She knows who okay. he is. She knows his name. She knows kind of where he is. But he, um, the trauma of this car accident, you know, like, it's affected his hearing and, lo- like, having the fact that she died and they were, like, stuck in this backseat together while she's bleeding out. Like, he that has some trauma. Horrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he left Korea and went to, I think, Germany. And so she's trying to get a transfer to the Germany office and trying to figure out a way that she can see him. And then they get news that, like, the the chairman's son is coming back to Korea. Mm. Um, he wants to head up the hotel division, which was his mom's division. Okay. Um, and the hotel division is failing. So he's, like, coming back to save it. And so she requests a transfer and gets a job with the hotel division and meets him and immediately makes everything very awkward. <laughs> 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 and... Um, she kind of hints to him that he knows her, but okay. she won't tell him how. And that's kind of about where it ends for the first volume. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. I like that setup. Yeah. Okay. I always think it's weird. It doesn't bother me personally, right? But, like, let's talk about Twilight. Yeah. And it's like they meet, and it's like, well, technically he's 17. 
But technically, he's, he's like 17. 300, you know. <laughs> For a while. And so with her, you're like, I guess it's kind of the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. Technically, in a way, she's a couple hundred years old. Right. But technically, but I guess it does kind of solve that problem, too, because it's like, well, I mean, if he's like, it's less weird to me if he's like 25, let's say. Right. You know what I mean? Because I'm like, eh, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> yes, I would find it unusual if a 25-year-old was dating a 100-year-old, but... I don't know. Yeah. Just something about it if that I'm like. she seems 19. Eh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I like so, it. Yeah. yeah. I I quite enjoyed volume one. I'm still kind of thinking about it. And I think I want to read the book series before I watch the Netflix show. Yeah. Just because, I don't know. That's how I usually do it. Yeah. Because then usually I can be like, this is disappointing. Right. <laughs> but I'd rather get the disappointment second. Yeah. Because those story beats, I'm, if you watch the show first and then you read the book and then you're like, oh, I should have read this first. Yeah. It doesn't really There's work. There's no getting that back. Yeah, you can't, can't put that genie back bell. in the bottle. <laughs> yeah. Other sayings that mean... <laughs> <laughs> All right. I enjoyed it. I brought four books. Three I'm ready. of them are on a theme. Oh, and I love your themes. I'm guessing that you can pick it out. The first one is not on theme and it's Monster Blood by R.L. Stein. Okay. A Goosebumps book, which I promised last time, uh, which I also brought some stories about slime because uh, it was a rabbit hole discovery I made. Uh, Next, Choose Your Own Star Wars Adventure, The Empire Strikes Back by Christopher Golden. Okay. This is a choose your own adventure type book that kind of puts the reader in the shoes of a nameless rebellion participant okay. who is kind of just around for the main events of The Empire Strikes Back. Okay. Next, I have Which Way Book 2, Supergirl, The Girl of Steel by Andy Helfer, which is also a choose-your-own-adventure gir- uh, book featuring Supergirl um, getting okay. into a pretty boring situation. Oh, well. Yeah. Who wouldn't want to read about that? <laughs> I know. I saw this on the shelf and I was like, where is this going to go? And then I was reading it and was like, it even worse than I thought. All right. I didn't have high hopes. Not because it was Supergirl, but because I was like... Is it know, like Supergirl goes to the laundromat? It's not that bad, <laughs> but it's lazier. <laughs> okay. If you can believe it. Because if Supergirl went to the laundromat and it was like, she had to choose between permanent press or regular wash. Oh, my God. Yeah, you'd be like, eh, yeah, no, I don't know. It didn't have steaks. Will but her clothes make it out of the dryer alive? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and last is Choose Your Own Adventure Space and Beyond by R.A. Montgomery. This is a classic choose your own adventure, you know, with the like white cover, with the red trim. Yes. Nice. So, you know, theme here is choose your own adventure. <laughs> No. Of three different styles. Impossible. I, I've been racking my mind. What is the theme? What is the theme? You just ruined it. I was going to guess. It's so funny because, like, I, I read – there. it's like a choose-your-own-adventure and then two knockoffs. Mm-hmm. And it's so funny because the way they do these is, like, you know, you can't really copyright the idea of a choose-your-own-adventure book. Yeah. So they just have to come up with a name that basically expresses choose-your-own-adventure yeah. without – Uh, explicitly saying the phrase, choose your own adventure. (laughs) You know, as just an interesting side conversation, we've known each other for a while. Mm -hmm. And I happen to know that at one point you endeavored to map out every choice in a choose your own adventure novel. That just happens to be the one that I brought space and beyond. Okay. I I brought the map. Well, in that case, we got to start there. Okay. So, uh... I have a, a on and off desire to read all of these and to make my way successfully through one. Yeah. One mainline choose your own adventure <laughs> is you all I'm live, really You want to survive looking. a book. I, yeah. Not just survive, but come out with what I would call a good ending. Right. Because I would say mainstream choose your own adventures have like three tiers of ending, kind of depending on what the story is. Uh, <laughs> this lowest, is very scientific. Thank you. <laughs> I've done a lot of research. I know. <laughs> Lowest tier is usually death. Yeah. Or, you know, the story equivalent of that. Um, often a little bit grisly and often 
kind of comes out of nowhere. Right. Like you're not expecting it. Um then mid-tier is usually something like, you know, you're kind of, you're supposed to be in some kind of space war or something, and what ends up happening is you're like, well, I crashed my ship on a planet, and now I'm just kind of stuck there. Mm-hmm. And that's where it ends, and you're like, okay, like, I'm not dead, but I'm out of commission in the war, and like, yeah. this is not exactly me standing next to Chewbacca and getting a medal, right? right. Um, and then there's good endings, and the good endings are, yeah, me getting a medal and saving the universe or, like, uh, I think there was one about track and field mm-hmm. that was about avoiding using steroids, which in my experience was not difficult to do in high school. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was more difficult to use them than not use them. Sure. Based on the experience I had, which was never being offered them. Right. And uh, never even having to do anything to not, you know. Right. You didn't have to go out of your way to avoid them. They just were not in your path. Yeah. It was a very, like, 80s, 90s drug message, which is, like, somebody on your track team is going to set up a spring-loaded jack-in-the-box so when you open your locker, you're injected with steroids. Well, you know, in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the coach was feeding the whole swim team. There you go. Weird drugs that turned them into fish men. Now, this could be because I was not a very good athlete, So they were like, I mean, if we give this kid steroids, he's going to be a mediocre athlete. (laughs) Doesn't seem like a great use of steroids, but whatever. Um, Okay, so with Space and Beyond, I tried to map out all the possible choices and figure out the good endings. I'm going to show you this chart. And that's an intense flow chart. It's really weird. It was a really difficult thing to make because it's not linear, right? Right. Um, Well, and you can get the same ending from multiple paths, right? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, The greens on here are good endings. Red are bad and yellow are the medium. There are one, two, three, four, five, six green endings and quite a few red. (laughs) Well, let's let's say we wanted to uh, express this as a percent. Uh, I would say you have about a 14% chance of getting a good ending. But the reality is you probably have a tenth of that chance. Right. Because the choices you make are more likely to lead to a bad ending than a good ending. So if we just take the number of endings and divide, you have about a 14% chance. But realistically, you probably have like a 5% chance. (laughs) Um, Another thing about this is... Um, so basically, you know, the book is about some kind of space adventure. doesn't even really matter. Um, the second thing I learned about this is, uh, if there was the very first choice in the book, if you made the wrong choice on the first choice in the book, there was only one possible route to a good ending. Oh. So if you make the wrong first choice, which is in these books, almost always a completely arbitrary seeming choice, like... Do you put on your jacket or not? Right. You know, and it's like, I don't know. Sure. And so if you decided like, yeah, I'll put on my jacket, you would have almost no chance of winning. So it's a little bit like when you play Monopoly and, you know, at some point you're like, I'm doomed. Like I'm just kind of moving the corpse of my piece around the board until it's just sapped of all of its money. And then I, I don't know, go to jail or whatever happens in Monopoly. Um, so that's kind of what's happening if you make the wrong first choice in this book. And, uh, but you don't know, Mm -hmm. like you have no idea because it's so complicated. Um, then it's also like really easy to put yourself onto a path where you cannot, you can't win. It's over, but you still make several other choices after that. But you're doomed. You're going down the drain and you're just kind of like (laughs) deciding which direction you're going down the drain. But it's it's over for you. You know, it's like it's terrible. You're the spider getting flushed down the toilet. You're already dead. You just don't know it. Exactly. Um, There were two paths that I discovered in this book where it was literally a a coin flip. It was like uh, and it made the difference between a yellow ending or a red ending, a bad or a medium. And it was literally like, do you go left or right? And there was no, there's no, okay, 
This is a big thing with choose your own adventure mm-hmm. books that I really dislike because I thought going into them as an adult. I was like, well, I could probably game this system a little bit, right? right? There are clues. Yeah, there's got to be some kind of hint or some kind of logic to them. And I also, so the first time I was like going through this book, I was like, what is the like lesson they're trying to teach me here? Right. You know what I mean? Like there's probably some moral they're trying to, or like some. Avoid steroids. Yeah. (laughs) So I was like, all right, well, if I avoid the bad things, that should probably get me where I need to go, right? But it turns out the choices are just completely arbitrary. Yeah. And it's not like uh, – it's not like, you know, when you play like a game like Skyrim and they're like, you could help this uh, family who's been, you know, I don't know, all their stuff got stolen by bandits or something. Right. Do you want to give them some of your food or something? And you're like, I mean, there's obviously a good moral choice and, or the choice that you're like, forget it. I'm on my own, you know? Yeah. Choose Your Own Adventure does not work like that. It's almost like Choose Your Own Adventure. The author, R.A. Montgomery, was like writing a, a lifelong treatise on the random chaos that makes up the world and the yeah. universe. It's almost like his philosophical statement of like entropy is in all things. There's, you know, it's butterfly effect. You can't possibly know what the outcome's going to be. So here's my question. Sure. Do you think that when the author was writing this story, they wrote every single plot line through? Or do you think they divided it out into, like, the beginning, all of the intermediate scenes and the ends, and then the publisher just, like, plugged in page numbers? That's a great question. And I don't actually know. There is a pamphlet that... R.A. Montgomery wrote about how to write your own choose your own adventures that I have not been able to get my hand on, but I've been trying because I am also torn between those things because I'm like, yeah, you could do it. You could basically just write out the narrative, right? And then be like, all right, well, here are some points where it could diverge. Yeah. But a reason I think that may or may not be true, it's confusing, but depending on your decisions, it alters the universe of the story. So in this particular story, there's like a a disease that's going around. And if you make a choice, assuming you're immune to the disease, because it's possible that you're immune to the disease, um, you will find that you are immune to the disease. And so it works out. But if you make the choice the other way and say, like, I'm not going to assume that I'm immune to this disease, um, it turns out you are not immune to the disease. Okay. So, So believing makes it so. Yeah, it's kind of a manifest destiny situation (laughs) where you're like, if I believe that I'm not going to get this, I won't, you know, or something. Mm. It's really weird. And that's where I get confused. Yeah. Because I'm like, well, it doesn't work for it. This is when my brain kind of melted (laughs) because I was like, it's not even a consistent universe. You know what I mean? Like you make a choice, but it should be. That you make the choice, but the universe remains the same. Right. You're either immune or you're not, and how you behave yeah. shouldn't affect your immunity. Right. But in this book, it does. Yeah. And it's so it's like, well, I should have, yeah, made my own decision, and but that shouldn't have affected whether or not it was true. Right. And yet it does. <laughs> and so it's almost like the book is being written two lines ahead of what you're reading. Yeah. And it's just like, but ultimately, the whole thing is that it just funnels you into doom. You know what I mean? Like everything is trying to get you to doom. Um, (laughs) So I had two favorite parts of this particular book. Okay. Though. Uh, Second best part, (laughs) you come upon a race of people who, through some kind of time nonsense, are torn between the past and the future and kind of living in both simultaneously. Okay. So there's an illustration. It's what I can only describe as, like, grandma's faces on babies' bodies. (laughs) And it's really disturbing and weird. (laughs) But the best part is there is an ending where you become a space pirate. Um, But then what happens is... It kind of like goes into a coda and it's like, well, you've been a space pirate now for many years. um, But what happens is the universe kind of goes um, socialist, I guess. 
And everybody just – it's like a Star Trek optimistic future. Right. Where it's like everybody has what they need. Right. And there's no real need for conflict anymore. Um. But it's actually kind of a bad ending for you because you spent your life plundering all this stuff and getting all this treasure. And everybody's like, hey, yeah, you know, <laughs> there's really no use for treasure anymore. <laughs> so it's like a good ending because you're like, well, I ended up in a peaceful future where right. everything's good. You and survived, like survived, yeah. got everything you need. Yeah, I could just walk into the hospital and they'll fix me with some ray and I'll probably live to be 500 years old. But it's also like, but your life has no meaning anymore because yeah. you spent all your time learning space pirate skills that are of no use to you. Yeah, no one needs a space pirate. It's like being someone who spent their entire uh, early adult life working on their writing, and then somebody's like, I invented chat GPT. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, good. Great. Well? Do you need a moment? No, I'm fine. Okay. I've had a long time to accept this. Okay. You know, I can always hope that something will just explode and it won't work anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't think Chat GPT is really there. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I didn't think it would be if you asked me five years ago, would it be where it is today? I would be like, no. Yeah, that's not something to worry about. I mean, it's it's still it's making stuff up. Yeah. So. Well, I think I think the that. future is about you know having very human narratives, and people knowing that there is a human person behind the narrative. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if companies will do this, they will use chat GPT to try and create that stuff. But then the problem is once people find out that was created by AI, they'll be like, well, I don't trust this company anymore. Yeah. Like they tried to convince me that that was a real person who told this story that touched my heart about, you know, some yeah. event that happened with their mom or whatever. It was all lies. Yeah. And it was all a lie. And so anyway, I think that's the future. Yeah. Is being genuine. Yeah. But we'll see. Anyway, that was way, way more thought than anyone has put into any individual choose your own adventure. Yeah. <laughs> and so I will conclude with uh, I think I've done somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 of the official choose your own adventure series and made it through none. <laughs> yeah. As an adult. So if anyone has a trick, I've tried many tricks too. I've tried. Random coin flip. I've tried doing what I call Costanza-ing. There's an episode of Seinfeld where George is like, I make the wrong decision all the time, so I'm going to just make the opposite. Whatever right. I would choose, I'm going the opposite. I tried that. didn't work. I've tried going with, like, the morality angle. I've tried going the opposite angle. I've tried so many things. I've tried being like, I'll just go with whatever the bigger page number is. <laughs> Nothing works. I don't know. I don't get it. <laughs> One of these days you'll make it through and then like your house will burn down. Yeah. And you you won't have any proof. Like I know. <laughs> I'll I'll make it through and then yeah, something will happen to the recording of whatever. Right. And yeah, it just won't I don't know. I keep thinking like if I do enough of them, it'll be like the matrix and I'll see the code. You know? <laughs> I'll see the path. You are the one. Yeah. <laughs> I keep thinking, but I'm like, how many do you have to do? Because yeah. I've done like 20. That's a lot. More than 20. It's a lot. Yeah. I've been a karate master. I've been a <laughs> parasailing. Well, you know, at <laughs> least you're having adventures. I guess. They all end in calamity, you yeah. know. It's like uh, that movie, that Tom Cruise movie, where he keeps dying and then comes back to life and does it over so, again. When you say you've done 20, does that mean that you read through until an ending? Yeah, I I do usually just go through, you know, uh, and get to an ending, and that is when I consider it being done. Okay. Sometimes I do go back through then and, like, explore Right. What would have happened if I'd done this or what if I did that? Well, I but. had a tendency when I was reading these as a kid to like my very first decision led to me like immediately dying. Yeah. And that's never satisfying. No. No. And then you're reading it with like all of your fingers and yep. the different decisions because you're like. And that's the thing is I'm like, yeah, you could have made the wrong decision 10 decisions back and not even know. Yeah. Yeah, the only way to do it is to map it out. That's the yeah. only way I've figured out how to do it so far. Madness. And that is so unsatisfying. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because you're like, well, I mean, it's kind of cheating. 
Yeah. I don't know. It's like the lottery. Yeah, it really is. So my next my next scheme is uh, I bought a book of dream interpretation mm -hmm. that you put oh. your dreams in and then it gives you lucky numbers. Oh. And so I'm like, all right, I'm going to go with that. And then I'll do like, a, you know, one, two, three, four, and then pick whichever yeah. or see whichever page number is closer to the lucky number. Yeah. This is how deep into the rabbit hole I've gone. Of maybe like, the answer's in the stars. Maybe. It's as likely, apparently, yeah. as me making, like, logical decisions as an adult man. So, <laughs> whatever. Well, good luck. Thank you. All right. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I want to hear about Misery and Low. Okay. Misery Lark Bride. Bride. By Allie Hazelwood. Allie Hazelwood. So she kind of made a big splash in the romance scene because she wrote, I think we actually talked about one. She wrote a series of romance novels about uh, female scientists. Mm, okay. um, so there was like a neuro neuroscientist and somebody who did like physics or something with space. I don't remember. but that Sounds vaguely familiar. Yeah. And they were all like, like nerds in the workplace finding love, you know. I think the one that we talked about, she had some sort of, she had like a low blood sugar or something. She fainted a lot. <laughs> but anyway. I shouldn't laugh at that, but I don't know. I mean, it was, it's funny. She writes romantic comedies, so it is funny. Um, okay, good. It so yeah. was played for humor. It was, See, yes. I, I detected that. Yeah. It wasn't a life-threatening problem. Right. Um, and the, so they were very popular and, and did very well, and they're great. And um, so she got quite a following and became a bestseller. Um, so as a reader, uh, like a romance reader and a writer, her roots are kind of in something like they're, they're in fan fiction, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, so she kind of got her start writing for um, the uh, archive of our own. Like oh, yeah. It's, yeah. Okay. Um, so she kind of got her start there along with a lot of other romance writers kind of got their start what there. What is that, that pipeline? There's some kind of – there's like a fan fiction to romance sort yeah. of – that well, seems like the most common crossover into, yeah. the, you know. Well, because of, you know, like people, there's like some fill in the blank TV show, you know, story, whatever, characters. And people ship characters that mm -hmm. don't get together. And so your your friendly neighborhood romance writer is like, I can make that happen for you. And uh, they write an alternate universe mm -hmm. where things work out the way that you wish. So that you you can find like... Buffy and Angel actually end up together and, and are happy. Or, you know, Captain Kirk and Spock, like, fall in love. Like, you can, whatever your ship is or whatever you wish would have happened, you can find it in, like, fanfic. And I don't know. I find it so funny, the, the Kirk and Spock, because that's kind of like the original popular yeah. thing, right? But I always thought that that was, for me, somehow, it was more tender as a bromance. Yeah. That it was like not a, uh, it was a platonic mm -hmm. love. See, I'm, I tend I don't know, to be with you even as a was, romance reader. I yeah. feel like I I can get love stories all over the place, like really good, satisfying ones. But people don't write a good friendship. Yeah, and it's so tough. when I get a really good friendship, it makes me so happy, and I don't want to mess with it. Yeah, that's kind of how I felt too. I was I I felt like their relationship was like beyond. Like, making out did not deepen their relationship. <laughs> but this is getting, like, way too, yeah, way too deep. Yeah, <laughs> Way too into Star Trek and other things yeah. that we shouldn't. That is not why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But anyway, um, Allie Hazelwood specifically um, kind of found herself deep in one of the weirder corners of fanfic called the Omegaverse. <laughs> I love it. And I, it is an explicit place that we're not going to talk too much about. All right. Because it's difficult to talk about. More mature about a... than I feel comfortable discussing on a library podcast. Is the Omega verse sort of tangential to the Tingle verse, perhaps? Dr. Chuck Tingle kind of? Um, less overtly bizarre. Okay. Like, it's more defined. Actually, there was a whole thing years ago where somebody who was writing Omegaverse fanfic tried to copyright a lot of the terms from this fan 
fiction. It's all like standard. Everyone uses the same words, but she was like, mm. they're my words. And it ended up in court. And Ugh. so there's like court transcripts of people talking about some very dirty things. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, she completely lost because people have been writing this for ages. And Can you just uh, imagine, like, there's got to be... I went for jury duty a little while ago, mm-hmm. and I just sometimes imagine, like, being in the courtroom. There was, I think it was the movie Frozen, and some lady claimed that that was based on her life. Yeah. And I was just like, how? Yeah. Like, how could this... You were a magic snow princess with ice powers? Yeah. You know, it's like someone claiming that X-Men is based on their life. And I'm like, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know, man. <laughs> like, yeah. People will try for all kinds of things. It's just, I so. picture being on that jury and just being like, oh, my God, do we seriously have to listen? Like, do we really have to do this? Yeah. Yeah. Can we just go home? <laughs> So anyway, Allie Hazelwood has her roots in Omegaverse fiction, okay. um, which is where she decided to kind of follow her heart after writing. She is a scientist in regular life. So oh, she, okay. when she wrote these like science rom-coms. The right um, what you know. Yes, exactly. Um, and then after she was a success, a success, she had a little freedom to kind of like experiment. So she was like, I'm going to go back to my first love gotcha. and I'm going to write something that has – it's not Omegaverse, but it has some, like, hints of that. Sort of um, like uh, when a film director does, like, a one for you, one for me. Exactly. Or, like, Nicolas Cage he right. makes some crazy movie that, like, shouldn't yes. exist, and he's terrible in it, and then he makes Pig, and you're like, what are you doing? Like, yeah. <laughs> Emilio Estevez is in the Mighty Ducks, too, so he can make yes. whatever that movie was he made after that. Right, yeah. right. He's yeah. like... Coach Bombay is back. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's exactly like that, except okay. I think with a little more enthusiasm from her publisher because sure. they're yeah. like, people love you and they'll read whatever yeah, you write. Yeah, do whatever. Go yeah. for it. Um, so if you're interested in Omegaverse, Google with caution, but it's out there. <laughs> you can figure it out for yourself. Um, we're not going to take just, a tour there right if, now. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to go there. Um, if you're at all concerned because you're like, that sounds like maybe it's too much for me. I would go with that and just not Google it. And if that's if, the vibe you're having, yeah, trust your gut on that one. <laughs> and you can you can read Bride, and if Bride is too steamy for you, then definitely don't go further into Omegaverse okay. stuff. That's a good this way is to like do it, right? Light hints of Omegaverse stuff. Toe in the water, exactly. Okay. So you've got um, our main character, Misery Lark, who <laughs> was born a vampire. And because of all of this, like, power imbalance and the the wares and the vampires always kind of constantly being on the verge of war, um, they came up with this system where um, some a child of importance to the vampires would be swapped with a child of importance to the wares, mm. and they would grow up with the opposite faction or mm-hmm. with humans. You mm-hmm. know, they would they would be taken away and raised, like— with humans, and then if somebody broke the peace, then the implication is, you know, they get to execute th- this child. And sure. so it's like a detente thing. Like, yep. you won't move and we won't move because we both value these kids. And so It was like the medieval version of having nukes or something. Exactly, where you're yeah. Like, well, we can't do it because then they'll do this. Exactly. Yeah. So Misery, when she was very young, she was sent to grow up with humans as one of these, um, like, basically a chess piece in this political game between okay. the two factions. And um, So she is a vampire? She's a vampire. Okay. Yes. Growing up with humans. not werewolves. Yeah, with oh, like humans. a human caretaker. Yeah. Oh, okay. She's growing up with a human caretaker and was finding it very difficult and normally the vampires tended to be very stoic and like self-contained and she was like upset and crying and they were like man she's a, she's <laughs> How did a we problem get this vampire <laughs> so they f- ended up finding an, an, a little girl a little human girl about her age and be like here here's a friend like shut uh, up yeah. so they grew up together <laughs> <laughs> here's a friend shut up <laughs> basically like they they didn't really they like as caretakers didn't care much for her yeah so I feel like what you the way you just said that, I feel like most parents have a moment where they think that. Right. They probably don't say it. Right. But they're just like, mm, she's here's the Teletubbies. Go like, away. Just give me ten minutes. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm gonna sit. Just I'm gonna go in the bathroom and turn on the shower and just sit up against the wall and yeah. cry. <laughs> like, yeah, I just need a minute. Basically. <laughs> Um, so Misery grows up with this uh, human girl and they're like best friends. And as soon as her term as this like chess piece is over, um, they actually – she elects not to go back and live with the vampires. She never felt at home there. Mm. Um, they're cold. She doesn't have a connection to her father really. She has a bit of a connection to her brother. But other than that, like – Sure. Not really. They're like uh, – vampires historically have a very low – fertility rate Mm. so monogamy is not really a thing so you know family units are not really a thing because it's basically like do what you can to have a baby and if you get one thumbs up like we need we need more vampires (laughs) all right so um she ditches them and just uh, chooses to live with the humans files her teeth which sounds horrible so that she um will not be like recognizable as a vampire Mm. And is roommates with this best friend who becomes a reporter who uh, mostly does like financial reporting, like business stuff. Honk shoe. Honk shoe. Yeah. Um, And then one day, like they have a a little bit of a fight and then her friend doesn't come home after work and then doesn't come home even after that. And eventually she's like, well, this feels like she's probably missing. Like Mm. she doesn't she's not going to write off that maybe she was just like. You're too much trouble. I'm done with you. I'm headed to New York City. Like, maybe that could happen. But she's concerned enough that she's like, I need to figure out what happened to her. Yeah. And so she gets, like, summoned by her father who proposes this thing. He's like, we have uh, our, like, human liaison is changing, like, retiring. We're going to have a new one who's, like, an unknown quantity and wants to end this, like, system of swapping kids we need to keep the peace, so we're proposing an arranged marriage between you, if you say yes, and, like, the leader of the werewolves. And okay. she – so since she thinks she can get some – like, she can get access to computers, she's, like, a techie girl. Mm. She's like, I'm going to do this so that maybe I can get on the werewolf computers and figure out what happened to my friend. Okay. So, like – Now I'm picturing a werewolf computer. <laughs> it's it's like, just a regular computer. Ah. You know, just in a werewolf house. Yeah, I was uh, honestly, I was just picturing a regular computer, but with fur. Which <laughs> <laughs> is really silly. I don't know why it would be that. So basically, but shaped like a big dog bone or something. Oh uh, yeah, no. <laughs> All their phones are dog bone shaped. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> this is why my paranormal romances never work. Yeah, because well, I'm too busy thinking about. Everything's like a Theming dog everything. thing, right? Yeah. yeah. That's not that's not fun for anyone. Everybody else is like, no one cares. <laughs> I, actually, I would I would put the book down if it was like, <laughs> and their house looks like a giant dog house, and all of their phones are like dog bones, and I'd be like, mm, no. The werewolf family has a dog, which is pretty weird. They like, all wear dog how collars. How do they interact? <laughs> <laughs> they have tags. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is good for me. This helps. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't, know what they're looking do for. That. The audience is not looking for what I'm selling. So you've basically got a traditional trope in romance, which is the marriage of convenience. Mm-hmm. And um, it's supposed to be, like, two years, and then they'll get an annulment. Um, and it's, like, a marriage in name only kind of a okay. situation. And she's basically in this house kind of as a prisoner. Like, everyone's always constantly watching her. They think of her as the enemy. And she, so she's like trying to skulk around, get information, which looks very suspicious, but not for the reasons that they think, like they think she's like a spy for the vampires. Mm. She just wants to find her friend. Mm. And meanwhile, she starts to like get to know individuals within this werewolf community and they're having their own like weirdness, like the, the alpha, he's a new alpha who took over for some very specific reasons and she starts to figure out why that happened and is sympathetic with them, starts to think he's actually kind of a good guy and um, he has like a little sister and she gets very attached to the little sister. And so she's investigating this situation, navigating this weird complex political system and, you know, also starting to like care for this new group that she's been kind of thrust into Mm. and it is the first in a forthcoming series. So, okay. Yeah. So does it end in like a 
end or it does is it kind of romance novel so that means happily ever after okay so her book ends with her in a happily ever after okay the next book will be about a side character oh okay. and you know who it is by the end of the book i'm not going to say because if you want to read it gotcha. i don't want to spoil anything so it kind of expands the universe yes how would i put that horizontally instead exactly. of exactly well on the z-axis instead of on the x-axis yeah. this is very common with romances okay. so you'll have like a group of sisters or a group of you know work colleagues or people with some connection and it will kind of go through them one by one okay and match them up i see yeah i see i gather that's how ice planet barbarians goes yeah because that does yeah begin and end and has kind of an ending mm -hmm. and then i think it yeah. focuses on other characters. They all the stand following. alone and they like develop off of each other. But romance series are a little unusual because usually you can read them in any order. And the only thing you're spoiling is that the couple from the previous books got together. Surprise, surprise. Right. Everyone knew that going in. Right. So you're not really spoiling it. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. But all anyway, right. this book, it's very spicy. I've read spicier, but I've read very deeply in the genre. So... That's not a surprise. I think a lot of people would find this on the spicier side of what they're used to. Okay. Um, and But it's very funny and good world building. And um, if, if you're into like the paranormal alternate universe stuff with some hint of mystery and some political machinations, okay. um, I think that it's a great place to start. And hey, if you're in it for the spicy. Yeah, it's there. There you go. It's there. It exists. Yep. All right. All right. So I feel like we have been down that choose your own adventure rabbit hole. Okay. So I'm going to pick Monster Blood. Great. So Monster Blood is, I think, the second. No, third. It's the third because the plant one is the second. Yes. Stay out of the basement. Yes. So Monster Blood is a story of a kid who gets dropped off with his aunt who uh, is a person with deafness. A deaf person? Deaf person. I'm not sure what... Um, if they're completely deaf, I would say deaf. If they okay. have some hearing, hearing impaired. She is deaf. Okay. Um, which is, I guess, I guess important in the story. <laughs> not really. <laughs> kind of. Well, representation. Uh, uh, yes. Sort of. Yeah. You know, it turns out she's deaf because of a witch's curse, which gets reversed. Sure. So I don't know. I don't know how that works. I, should, but I feel like I should, ha as an aside, mention that I'm hearing impaired, which is why we're having this like, weird kinda, yeah. conversation. That is why I was sort of like asking Megan, like, <laughs> what is it? Yeah. Anyway, I don't know why I wrote that part down. It, it was very significant in the beginning of the story, so I kind of expected it to like play a major <laughs> role, right? Well, like something's going to happen, and it's like... I don't know, a monster's creeping up on the ant and she can't see, hear it because she's deaf. Yeah. Something. Well, I would like to say that it's nice to have a deaf character in a children's book because then kids will say they know the term deaf and won't say death. Oh, is that something? You yes. <laughs> Including You're a myself. Deaf person. Apparently, I was at one point a little blonde girl with long, long platinum blonde hair walking around telling strangers that I was deaf. <laughs> so. As much as I don't want kids to call deaf people death people, yeah. there's something very charming yeah. about a child <laughs> saying, and scary. I was going to say, and there's, some, there's a creep little bit creepy, there. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he, he goes to live with his aunt. I think it's his, it's his great aunt. Okay. His dad's aunt, who he also lived. All these Goosebumps books are basically start with the kids, like, yeah. being with some relative yeah. or, like, being pawned off How on do somebody. we get them away from the caring adults? Yes. <laughs> How do we get their parents out of the picture? It's very Disney that way, except yeah. they don't usually kill the parents. Right. It's usually, like... Uh, how do we make it so these kids are kind of on their own? Right. And you got to figure it out, which I think is a core fear of a child. Yeah. Is you're like, I don't know how to make food. Right. Let alone I'm solve not allowed to touch the stove. A monster. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he, you know, makes like a little friend and they go to the toy store, which is like some creepy toy store. And yeah. he finds this little can of something called monster blood, which is basically gack or... You slime. know, slime, yeah. whatever. Uh, and it, you know, turns 
bigger. It changes temperature. It becomes the blob or the stuff or the blob from the blob remake, which in one scene skeletonizes a child, which was Ooh. pretty horrifying. All right. It's, it's you know, kind of low-key up till then, and then they're, like, escaping from the blob in the sewer, and it just grabs this kid and turns him into a skeleton, like yeah. a child, and turns him into a skeleton, and you're like, whoa, the blob, you really went there. Pulling no punches. No. I assume it's not like the stuff in that they don't eat it, though. They don't eat it. Okay. No. Um, it's, they think it's just a toy, and then sometimes they pick it up and it's, like, weirdly warm, and mm-hmm. it seems to keep growing, you know, and weird stuff like that. It's alive. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so my theory on Goosebumps now is that each book was written to teach kids a lesson. Okay. I think R.L. Stein may have been parenting his children via <laughs> scaring them out of doing things that he well, didn't want them to do. I mean, fairy tales. Right? Yeah, exactly. Don't go into the woods. There's a wolf that'll kill you. Exactly. And it's like, okay, so that's like, yeah, don't go in the woods. There's animals there. They may yeah. kill you. Um, and so like the 1990s version of that is like, (sighs) could you not buy slime that's going to like ruin all our furniture? (laughs) Like, you know, it's more suburban, more subdued. It's going to get stuck in the carpet and it's a whole ordeal. Yeah. And so I started looking into slime in the 90s and found these types of slime were available on the market. Gak, Flarf. Floam, Slime, Pizza Gack, Smell My Gack, UV Reactive Gack, Smud, Flubber, Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters Ectoplasm, and Flarp. <laughs> wow. <laughs> there were so many. And this doesn't include, uh, most kids from that era will be familiar with like the quarter machine at the store. Mm-hmm. And you could get a little capsule that had either some kind of slime in it or very popular was the sticky hand. It was oh, kind I remember of a gelatinous thing. Yeah. The really like premier ones had a plastic handle. And I always thought it was so funny because the way they advertised those on the machine, it was like a kid who had the sticky hand mm-hmm. and he was using it to like wrangle a dollar that was sitting on the sidewalk. Yep. It was like these other kids were about to pick up this dollar someone had dropped, but because he had his sticky hand, he was able to, like, get it out just in time. And, you know, I was like, that has literally never happened. Yeah. Ever. There's no way. I'm a little bit older than you, so I was a bit too too old for the, like, the sticky hand. When I was young, our version of it was the sticky octopus that you threw on the wall and it it kind of climbs down. down. Yeah. Leaves like a grease trail. Kind of, yeah. That, yeah. The bane of every mom's existence. Although my mom got them for me, so. My I mom. Rem- I think that was one of the gifts I got when my brother was born. It was like, here's a thing. Keep yourself busy. We're tired. <laughs> my mom, we had some gack and some things, but it was very reluctant on the part of parents. Yeah. But I had a divorce parents situation so I think part of the reason that I had GAC was because of one parent trying to one-up the other parent. Yep. And I had one very irresponsible parent and one very responsible parent. I wonder who got you the, the slime. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> who got you the bright pink GAC that could be mashed into a carpet and never recover? Um, my mom, I remember one time we had like a sticky ball. It was like an amber-colored golf ball size, just sticky yeah. ball. And she was like, just don't stick it to the ceiling. Cause she was like, I'm not going to get it down for you. And like, I'm tired of it. It like leaves grease spots on the seal. Don't do it. Of course. Uh, I came up with this brilliant game. I turned on the ceiling fan and would lay on the floor and try and throw the gack ball up. So it didn't hit the fan blade and then came back down without hitting the fan blade. This does not surprise me. It took 30 seconds for me to stick it to the ceiling. That slime ball stayed on the ceiling for over a decade. Wow. That was how hard my mom refused to get it down. <laughs> I respect it. And, you know, like being a kid, it's like at first you're like, oh, I really want to get that down. And I didn't ask because she had made such a big deal yeah. of like, do not throw it on the ceiling. And then eventually she saw it and was like, great. You know, like. I was like, I bet she's really reevaluating a lot of her life choices that have led to this moment, you know, and just like, where have I gone wrong? Yeah. It's like if you were the mom of like a multiple murderer and you're sitting in the courtroom (laughs) and you're just like, 
playing back through your head all the decisions you've made. Anyway, I looked online uh, and found several Reddit posts about things kids did with slime. Okay. And I would like to share some of these with you. I await. All right. Oh, man, I loved this bleep as a kid. For some reason, I decided... This is Nickelodeon Gak. For some reason, I decided to stuff it down the sink drain as I tried to scoop it back out. I ended up just stuffing it deeper into the sink's piping. I was too scared to tell my parents what I did and figured it would just slowly wash away. Instead, it turned rock solid and clogged the sink. I decided to feign ignorance as to how it got clogged, so my folks had to call a plumber, and of course he had to take the whole sink apart. And what do you know, there is a bright orange mass hardened into the pipes. My parents almost killed me when they realized it was the gack they got me. I don't even know why I did that, but needless to say, I was never allowed to get it again. Yeah. Uh, Here's a short but sweet one. Upon touching gack for the first time, I vomited. (laughs) (laughs) And I never touched gack again. (laughs) Uh, That's a special journey for parents. (laughs) I just imagine, yeah, the parent, like... One finger touches the gag instantly, and they're like, great. <laughs> Glad I got that. Um, I had the scented gag that was supposedly pepperoni pizza. It didn't smell like pizza at all. My theory is the scent was actually thyme, but that was too hard a to market to kids, so somebody figured pizza was close enough. But it reeked. My mom would not let me play with it indoors. <laughs> Sometimes I'd try to sneak it out thinking she wouldn't know, but within 30 seconds she would yell, put that back in the container or take it outside. <laughs> um, here's a kindred spirit. First day I got it, I threw it in my ceiling fan to see it go flying. It got stuck on the fan blade. It's still there to this day, and despite all attempts to get it out, it's still there hard as a rock. Uh... I left my gack on a parent's wood grain television set and woke up to find it had removed the finish and was grounded for life. (laughs) Yikes. I had a full tantrum at Universal Studios when I was seven or eight screaming, I want gack. (laughs) My parents were mortified and did not get it for me. I don't know why I thought a tantrum would work. They never did. I finally got it months later for Christmas, but to this day, my family still mocks me, I'm 29, (laughs) about it, and screams, I want Gak. (laughs) Yeah, that has the ring of truth to it. (laughs) Uh, When I was about nine, Chuck E. Cheese ran a promotion where you could somehow obtain limited edition Gak scented by going there, or limited edition scented Gak by going there. I don't remember the details, but my parents agreed to take me and a few friends for dinner. After loading myself up with greasy pizza and playing some games, I left with a small container of sunscreen-scented gack and another of pizza-scented gack. I played with them all the way home, despite the nauseating scent. About halfway home, I spray-painted the back seat of my parents' minivan with greasy pizza up Chuck. Uh. (laughs) Um, I was the coolest kid in school for about a week when I got back from a big mall in a big city with a big toy store. I grew up in a tiny, isolated town, and I brought Gak to school. Everyone had only ever seen it on TV. I was a celebrity. But then everyone wanted to touch it, and it got gross, and I was taught a valuable life lesson that day about the cost of popularity. (laughs) But imagine my good fortune when I showed up a year later with Floam, another kid cool, a cool kid fix for about three days. (laughs) This is my last one, and this is probably my favorite one. Okay. I wrote my first business letter to Gak. I used my own money to buy the rainbow-colored Gak, which within minutes turned gray from all the colors mixing together. Ten-year-old me was pissed, so I typed up an angry letter using the business letter format they taught us in school. My mom got a stamp and mailed it for me. They actually wrote back. It was a canned response, but still. They thanked me for my feedback, and they included coupons. I used the coupons to buy uh, Gak or slime. I can't remember. (laughs) And anyway. that kid grew up to be a librarian. I know. I was like <laughs> a 10-year-old writing a business complaint. Le- Dear sirs, I am not pleased. Dear with your- sir or madam. <laughs> yeah. I was unpleased, displeased by Gak <laughs> Rainbow in particular. It was marketed as rainbow colored, and yet what you failed to mention is that the colors would mix into a nondescript gray. Much to my chagrin as I've... <laughs> Cubed it out into carefully portioned. (laughs) 
<laughs> all right, so there you go. Okay. That's that's all I have to say. All right. Monster Blood's fine. You know, as most Goosebumps, it's fine. Yeah. Um, turns out, well, it turns out it, it has a very um, Dark Knight twist where there's more than one enemy. Ooh. The Blob is not the only enemy in this uh, <gasps> da, da, da. novel. I didn't think 120 pages could contain a twist of that magnitude, but sure enough. R.L. Stein's a master. He is. He's actually pretty good. Yeah. Like, well, I, I mean, I there were 7,000 of those for no reason. Yeah. Yeah. You would think if there's 7,000, you're like, well, I mean, how many are good? Like five. But I've read some knockoffs lately, and I'm like, hmm, Harl Stein knew what he was doing. Yeah. Some of these other fools. Yeah. I don't know, man. <laughs> 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 All right. All right. So um, I guess I'll go over my two that we didn't talk about. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked about uh, See You in My 19th Life. We talked about Bride by Allie Hazelwood. Um, I also have Greta and Valden by Rebecca K. Riley, uh, which I listened to on audiobook. I would actually recommend it on audiobook because there are a lot of different accents in this book. And this is more than one narrator, and you get like the, there are some really interesting accents, Scottish and New Zealand and uh, Spanish. And um, so that aspect was very fun. Uh, so it's about this family, namely, it's about um, Greta and Valden Vladisalvievich, I think is their name. Um, and they are siblings, and they are also roommates. So they. They're just part of this family that they're very smart. The dad is like some globally known expert on fungi or something like that. Sure. <laughs> He's yeah, a why not? Very famous biologist. And um, Valden was set to become like a very successful um, like physicist, like um, astrophysics of some kind. And then decided after almost completing his doctorate that he actually didn't like it that much and dropped out of um, his program and started um, hosting a travel show on New Zealand TV. Sure. And Greta is in grad school for literature, comparative literature. She does like Soviet, um, like the way that Soviet life is portrayed in Russian versus American literature is like her focus. Mm. Um, and like, so their, their dad, um, their, their grandfather fled Russia, um, as a refugee and their, their, so they all, they all speak like some level of Russian, uh, and their dad is now living in New Zealand and he married a Maori woman. And so they're like half Maori, half Russian, and uh, they have this, like, neurotic kind of personality. They're all connected to each other, and they all love each other and know each other, but they're also very much in their own heads and, like, living their own lives. Um, it's also a very gay story. So Greta is a lesbian, and Valden is gay, and um, he has an ex who he still thinks about who moved away to, I think, Argentina, and... Um, <laughs> Greta has ha had a hang up on someone in her program who it becomes very apparent is basically just using her to mm. like cover her tutoring sessions and stuff like that. <laughs> and it follows just, this. How come I couldn't have been hot enough to do, you know what I mean? <laughs> to get some tutoring. I, I mean, whenever I see that in a movie and it's like, oh, yeah, the, you know, the nerds tutoring the hot guy, I know I'm supposed to think like, no, nerd. You're being used right now. But I'm like, man, I wish I was hot. Like well, <laughs> she's the tutor. Oh, okay. Yeah. And she she gets her to, like, she's supposed to tutor someone, but she's like, Greta, could you cover for me? Oh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. That's what, I mean, that's what I'm saying is, like, you know, it'd be nice to be attractive enough to get away with things. Yeah. Just on your looks. Well, yeah. So it's basically, <laughs> <laughs> it's these, like, kind of damaged people who are like in their heads, but it ends up becoming this really lovely story of this family kind of finding themselves and finding a place in the world and figuring out what they think about things and learning to kind of value themselves and the people in their family. And it was, 
it was funny. Um, I think in the the blurb, if you read like the the publishers like marketing, it um, it uses Schitt's Creek as a read alike, mm. which isn't exactly right, but it has that it had that same emotional feel for me. Like I grew to care about these characters in a way that was similar to Schitt's Creek. Okay. So that'll give you an idea, maybe. Um, I, it's not they're very. It's not very long. The audiobook I think was eight hours. Okay. Um, and I by the end I was like so emotional and I was almost like crying at the end. It was so good. I loved it. Very nice. different for me, but. Okay. Very Sounds good. like a little bit. Maybe there's some flavor of uh, Royal Tenenbaums or something. Yeah, like that. yeah, yeah. Or Family Fang was kind of yeah. like that. Yeah, it's definitely like they're not an. They're like they've got quirks. Yeah. But they're also, like, they're not so weird that you can't relate to them. Right. Yeah. They're not unlikable. Right. They're just, like, weirdos. Yeah. And then by the end, they're your weirdos. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, And then I also had Why Rayliana Ended Up at the Duke's Mansion, Mm -hmm. Volume 1. Again, this is another one. I've only read Volume 1 so far. So this is the one where the character Yunha Park... Um, is, I think, pushed off of a building. It's very kind of nebulous. You're not sure exactly what's happening. All you know is that she seems to be falling, and then she wakes up, and she's in this very, like, fancy historical world with nobility and stuff like that. She's got, like, these fancy dresses and long, flowing, curly hair. And she figures out that she's in a book that she's very familiar with and Mm. that she knows well and loves. And she is unfortunately a character that is doomed to be murdered by her fiance. <laughs> and she's like, man, this sucks. Like, I, I'm, I don't want to sign up for this. So she starts to like, she's like, I'll make him break up with me. I'll just be super unpleasant. So she tries to push him away, from, you know, and he's not having it. Like, nope, we're sticking. And he becomes even <laughs> like almost worse to be around. So then she's like, well, how can I get out of this? And she sees this Duke at a party and she's like, that's my, like, he has enough power that I could mm. get out of this relationship. He could extract me from this problem. Yeah. But rather than, like, flirting and, like, trying to get him to, like, fall in love with her, she <laughs> takes a very strategic approach. And she knows from reading the books that he's looking for this royal seal. Mm. And since she's read the books, she knows things about the royal seal. Mm-hmm. So she approaches him and she's like, I, I have a proposal. Um, we pretend to be engaged. I will tell you what I know about the royal seal because I know you're looking for it. (laughs) And in return, you help me get out of this relationship that I don't want to be in. I think he's going to kill me. Hmm. And eventually, after like testing the waters, he's like, you know what? Fine. Okay. We enter this deal. All right. Um, But you have to move into my mansion and take like duchess lessons. You know, like you got like it's you. You're not going to embarrass me. Like you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be learn part. to be proper yeah. here. So it's about her. Like she moves to this palace, and she's you know trying to learn a bunch of different things, and also being trained in all of these duchessy arts, and like being dressed up in these fancy clothes, and having people do her hair and stuff. And so it's got this like historical like costume drama part. And also a little bit of this intrigue and a hint of like, will they, won't they romance to it. Like, I like, I just figured out what appealed to me about this because like I've read many a thing where this happens in video games all the time. Yeah. Books about video games where it's like, oh my God, I'm in the game. Yeah. And this seems like a version of that for book nerds. Yeah. It's like, oh my God, I'm in a Jane Austen novel. (laughs) Like. (laughs) Yeah, but I'm doomed. I have to yeah. change my fate. Oh no, I'm this, I'm this tragic character. Yeah, I don't want to be the tragic character. And a little flavor of like uh, Groundhog Day. Yeah, because it's like she knows what's gonna happen. Mm-hmm. She can be like, watch, this she guy is gonna ahead. do this. Like, well, and there's this question of like, there's the girl that he's supposed to end up with in the books, and when she shows up, what then? Yeah. You know, is it destined to still kind of reroute to the same fate, or yeah. is it like? No, you can change it from here forward. Yeah. Will she Good questions. end up in a worse place? Like, is she like condemning her to be unhappy now because she stepped into this role? 
I don't know. Also, do you think we get an answer eventually of why she was pushed off a building? I, I hope so. Or is that so. just like, eh. <laughs> like, I don't actually, like, it was, it, ha- it happened in like three pages and then we moved on and it was never referred to again. It must come back because I, otherwise yeah. they could just have her get hit by a bus or something. Sure. And or just, just be say like, like, like oh, I died and yeah. here I am. Like, yeah. If it was meant to just be to get us to this point, it could just be completely random. Yeah. Right. She's on the subway reading the book. Right. And then it crashes. And then, right. yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I plan on continuing to read both of these series because I enjoyed both of them quite a bit. Um, but in between other things, I've got a whole stack of library books I've got to get through. And I, I, just, I have to figure it out, Peter. <laughs> I have to figure it out. I've got to get these books out of my house. These are the dangers of working <laughs> in a library. Okay. I talked about Space and Beyond by R.A. Montgomery and Monster Blood by R.L. Stein. Uh, I didn't talk about Choose Your Own Star Wars Adventure, The Empire Strikes Back by Christopher Golden. Mm-hmm. Um, this was a book, if you are an adult and you are trying to trick your kid into reading, this is a great choice. Because in order to finish this book, you have to read so much. <laughs> like, between each choice, in, you know, in a Choose Your Own Adventure, you might read, I would say, a maximum of four or five pages before you get to a decision right. tree. Uh, this one is like 20 pages between decisions. Okay. And I was like, I see what you did here, So it's Star more novel It's It's like reading a novelization okay. of the movie. Um, the funniest thing is you're this like ancillary side character. You know, like usually you would expect to be like, you're Luke Skywalker. Right. But I think what they were trying to do is be like, well, the continuity of the story still has to happen the same way. Because right. I think Star Wars is a little bit more, you know, you can't have an ending where it's like, and then Darth Vader blew everyone up right. and that's it. Luke Skywalker misses the Death Star and yeah. um, and is killed in a crash. <laughs> like, the end. Yeah. Princess Leia was on all the Rand when it blew up. Right. Um, so I think... What's happening here is they're like, how can we put the reader into this story? But also their decisions really don't change the broad narrative. But also they have to be involved in everything. (coughs) So for me, as someone who has seen this movie 10,000 times, um, it was extremely easy (coughs) to get through this one successfully. Because I was able to, you know, when you're out and it's like, oh, you're with Han Solo looking for Luke in the snow and you find him. Should you try and walk back to the base or should you cut open right. a tauntaun and shove Luke inside? I wonder. Yeah. And I'm like, well, <laughs> duh. Everybody knows, like, obviously that's what you would do. And it was like, uh, and it wasn't trying to trick me. It was like, oh, yeah, if you make the decisions that facilitate the story of Empire Strikes Back, you get through it. Okay. So on one hand, satisfying. Because I was like, You're okay. able to get through it. Yeah. On the other hand, I felt tricked because I was like, I think this is trying to trick kids into reading. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's not like a normal choose your own adventure where, you know, you would, it's a maybe 150 pages, but right. you would read 50. It's such a weird position for you to hold as someone who I know reads. I know. I, know. I don't know. It's just, I felt tricked and I didn't care for that. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, but if you're a parent, and I was like, well, I wonder if you're a kid, if you haven't, it was hard for me to separate because I was like, I've seen this movie so many times. I know exactly what I should right. do. But maybe if you were a kid who hadn't seen it yet, if that Or exists, saw it once and, yeah. yeah. Didn't really understand it because yeah. you're like, oh, whatever. Um, the other one was Which Way Book Two, Supergirl, The Girl of Steel by Andy Helfer. Okay. Uh, this was a thrift store pickup. Okay. Uh, there are two things about this book. One was, so unlike the Star Wars book, you are Supergirl in this book. Okay. And it, the book begins with a preface that basically says, you're making the decisions for Supergirl. Now, if Supergirl was making her own decisions, everything would work out great because Supergirl is good at making decisions. So if something happens to Supergirl, it's because you were making the choices. Whoa. Way to just build a guilt complex on kids straight off the bat. It was kind of weird. And also I was like, is this like a weird comic book thing? Because they were like, they don't want kids to be like, well, Supergirl died in that book, you know? And they're like, Uh yeah, it was your fault. She died. But yeah, that was the other thing is I was like, all right. So it's kind of saying like, 
hey, little dum-dums, like, if she dies, it's your fault. Yeah. You suck at decisions. That's I mean, why she's dead. As, you know, neurotic, little, like, overly serious child Megan, I would be like, it's all my fault. I, I know. killed Supergirl. And so I was like, okay, well, this is serious right off the bat. But then what happens is the laziest thing that they could think of. So it's like a Supergirl adventure, and I was like, all right, well, they can put her up against, I don't know, Brainiac, whatever. What they choose to do is she's in school and goes into the classroom of a physics professor who has invented a ray that makes people go into books. You know, kind of a little bit like this story yeah, you're really talking Anna. about, except way worse because the book she goes into is The Wizard of Oz. So mm -hmm. then what happens is you are Supergirl, but you're basically just making the choices you would make for The Wizard of Oz. So Andy Helfer came up with a way to write a Choose Your Own Adventure book where he didn't have to create any plot at all. Because he's just like, well, what if you just... It's basically Wizard of Oz, Choose Your Own Adventure. You're and right. I would rather read about... Uh, Supergirl at the laundromat. Yeah, right, because I'm like, I know how Wizard of Oz works, yeah. A. B, being Supergirl has no effect on, yeah. you know, it's not like you're Supergirl, so you're like, well, yeah, I mean, I would go in here and when I'll just... When the Wicked Witch tries to steal you, you just fly away. Just cave in her face. Right. Like, <laughs> I mean, like, there's no... Hey, yeah, the Cowardly Lion is like, I'm afraid, and it's like, yeah, it's fine. Don't worry, I'll protect you. Yeah, I'm super. I can <laughs> shoot anything, so it doesn't really <laughs> matter. And you'd be like... Well, I know that the wizard is, you know, just some guy. Right. So, you know, whatever. Yeah. End of story. When he's first like, go get the broom of the witch, you'd walk over and move the curtain and be like, yo, can we skip this part? Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, A, it's incredibly lazy. Yeah. But B, I was like, it's not even a Supergirl story. Yeah. So what's the point? So it was super disappointing. Yeah. Two um, thumbs down. Other than that preface that was like. <laughs> yeah. Don't kill Supergirl. Don't just read this cavalierly thinking you're going to have fun. <laughs> this is serious. Yeah. Buckle up. Wow. Um, but I also survived that one because much like the Star Wars one, as long as you make the decisions. I was going to say, you know how to get through The Wizard of Oz. Of course you, yep. went, you made it through that book. The only decision that was a little difficult was it was like, do you walk along the yellow brick road or do you want to fly over the top of it? And I was like, I mean... I think flying over it would be the obvious, like, what's the difference? But I was like, I better walk on it because that's what Dorothy did. Yeah. And I was like, I'm going to make the decisions that are the closest to the movie. Yeah. And I think that was the right choice. Maybe if I'd flown over, it just takes you straight to the witch's whatever castle. Yeah. And then everything's fine. The flying monkeys are like, gotcha. Yeah. It, which, again, I was like, I mean, are the flying monkeys like a big threat to Supergirl? There have been many apes in the DC universe, and, you know, they mostly are handily defeated by, you know, even yeah, lo know. even lower tier superheroes. Did they have wings? Um, I don't know. I can't think of any Maybe that could that's fly. The secret. You're right about that. I mean, there's Titano. He's just a big ape. There's Gorilla Grodd. He's a super intelligent ape. There's Detective Chimp who's an immortal chimp who lives in a space bar who okay. <laughs> solves crimes. But none of them fly. None of them fly. <laughs> Just saying. There's been a sort of recent uh, detective chimp resurgence where it's like he's in a couple of stories been sort of a legitimate character, which is hilarious. Yeah. I love it. I, I like I like an inversion where it's like this should be ridiculous, so we're gonna take it super seriously. Yeah, that's always fun. It's kind of like what if Detective Chimp was the key to everything? <laughs> and I'm like, you know, it seems unlikely, but I'll read it. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, if that's your premise. I'm in. And those are my books. Those are my bad decisions I've made over the last month. We had some doozies. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not not my favorite reading month. Not a lot yeah. of things populated my, you know, best of 2024 <laughs> bookshelf. Well, I have to say, I really enjoyed all four of mine. Yeah. I had a good month. I had a real high Plus, low I had situation. an Alona Andrews. I know. I read a, a book that I reviewed for Library Journal that's not out until later this year, but I also, I really liked that one. All right. Which was, interestingly enough, another person wakes up in a book that they love story. Oh, so, weird. Yeah. It's a thing going around, so, huh? Yeah. When that's closer to release date, I, may, I might bring it up. We'll see. 
I just realized if I was going to do that kind of book, I would write a version where someone wakes up in the novelization of the movie Demolition Man. <laughs> oh. And then they'd be like, well, I've, I've seen the movie, but I never read the book. And there's like, oh, no, there's some important differences between the two. Are there? I have no idea. I've never read it. I've always, I've always wanted to have read it. Yeah. But I don't actually want to read it because yeah. I'm like... I mean, I don't think my life's going to be infinite. Yeah. If I was, you know, going to live forever until the sun turned into a red dwarf and collapsed in on itself in a distant future, maybe I'd be like, I got time to read the Demolition Man <laughs> novelization. But what are you not reading to take the time to read it? Yeah, that's, that's the, the other question. thing because it's like, well, I read Which Way to Supergirl I instead. I don't You do this to yourself and I don't understand it. I, I don't know. I make bad choices. Yeah. That's... You know, why did you read that? It's the whole ethos. I prescribe Greta and Valden to you because I actually think there's a chance you might like it. All right. I like a, a pretty weird, you know, yeah, the weirdest Yeah, it's very much weird. a character-driven story. It's, yeah. it's 100% about these characters. And they're a little, they're a little odd. Yeah. But in a way that, I don't know, I found endearing. I think I would like that. I like those kinds of things. Yeah. All right. In conclusion... We did it. We That's did it. The end. We're done. And uh, hopefully we'll stay on a more regular yeah. schedule again. Yeah. I think we will. I think so, too. I have taken over scheduling the podcasting studio, and so I think that that will help. A responsible adult's doing it now, <laughs> so I think that's going well, to make all the difference. And to be fair, you do pretty much everything else. Yeah. I show up and talk, and now I book the room, and that's pretty much all that I do. True. So. All right. We'll see you next time. We'll be here.